So we'll do some uh, introductions uh, of John O'Neiger. And uh, I um, do several things, including I have a, a kind of a consultancy design and planning firm, uh, Big River uh, Regenerative Design Group, uh, where we work with landowners and we help them um, design and plan different kinds of things in the land, um, including tree crops and productive systems, uh, soil management, uh, but also just master planning uh, um, um, and, and some more typical <laughs> landscape architecture stuff. And Keith Salzberg, if you were at the keynote, Keith Salzberg is my business partner who presented about the Healthy Soil Action Plan uh, that we're facilitating for the state. Uh, so that's the regenerative design group. And uh, for this talk here, I'm... Um, have a small uh, leased property in Sunderland uh, where um, put growing chestnuts and other things, uh, and that's Big River Chestnuts that we'll talk about. Great. Um, and I am Russell Wallach. I'm based in Amherst. Uh, my farm, Bread Tree Farms, is in Rensselaer County, New York. Um, I have done some similar consulting to John, although I, I uh, don't have quite the amazing experience that he does. Um, I, but I've also done quite a bit of work um, with consumer packaged goods companies, so cosmetics and beverages and snack companies, helping them to think about the environmental uh, consequences or potential um, of their, the agricultural systems that they source from all around the world. Um, and kind of coming out of that, I'm really uh, moving to spending most of my time on bread tree farms. So. That includes the farming operation, but it also includes looking at kind of creative financing solutions that might support uh, the development of more chestnut-based agroforestry in the region, and then also thinking about product development, which we'll talk a little bit more later. Great. Uh, so a logistics thing is uh, the NOFA folks have put a recorder here. Uh, so just to know you're being recorded. Um, probably low quality, I'm guessing. Uh, but... Just so you know. And then, um, primarily, uh, just to, to put out on the table for those who came more recently, we, we're talking primarily around Chinese and Chinese hybrids and chestnuts as an agricultural crop. On the one hand is the reintroduction or, or um, work to bring back the American chestnut into the forests of the Northeast or the East Coast. Uh, some really amazing work and, and great and important work. Um, but And this is a little bit on the side of growing chestnuts as a viable food crop for uh, our, us as a region, as a viable crop for farmers. So uh, gratitude for a lot of shoulders that we stand on. We're going to be talking a lot about information that we've gathered and the farms that we're putting together. Uh, and it comes from a lot of different people who have been doing this work for decades. Uh, we just mentioned uh, Sandra Anagnostakis, who works mm -hmm. at the Connecticut Agri She used to. She's retired and she lives in Walton. She just retired? Yeah. Gosh, but she still spends time She still shows up there, yeah. She <laughs> still shows up down there. And that's um, uh, Greg Miller, Empire Chestnuts, Michael Gold, who's at the Center for Agroforestry. University of Missouri, Tom Wall, Red Fire Farms, Dennis Fulbright, who passed away? Yeah, just recently passed away. Just recently. He's done a lot of the Michigan development. Yeah. And there's an amazing group, um, James Nave, I don't know if he's the one who started it, uh, but he, uh, there's this really great resource online, uh, we can talk about resources more, but that's um, a, a, sort of a network of chestnut um, people. Um, around the country, and the Chestnut Growers Association as well. So lots of people doing a lot of different work on different parts of this whole puzzle. Uh, and um, you might notice a lot of these people, or if, I don't know if you can tell from this, but I'd say is a lot of people are in the Midwest. And so there's sort of a, a need to uh, really get ourselves in gear here in the Northeast. Um, so as I said before, this is really um, about Chinese and Chinese hybrids, meaning crosses between some of the other different species besides Chinese. We've got uh, 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 Japanese chestnut and the European chestnut, uh, the American chestnut, even uh, some of the chinkapin species. Uh, so some of these 
trees that we're planting and putting in are complex crosses between different species. Uh, and there's a lot of work, some amazing selection work. Uh, here's Sandra and Magnastakis and um, um, at the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station where there's a lot of work that's been done. Um, but so what we're talking about is um, a, a really a potential tree that could be part of our food system. Right now, our annual um, of the consumption in the U.S., 90% is imported. Uh, so we grow very little of it. We only have about approximately 4,000 acres in the U.S. growing chestnuts. It's just an infinitesimal um, part of the, uh, the U.S. food system. And there's a, a lot of opportunity here, I guess, is the, the bottom line. That it would take thousands of acres. And people have tried to calculate exactly how many thousands of acres. Um, kind of depends some on how much, what our um, consumption levels are. And right now, we, um, um, in the U.S., people consume per capita a very small amount. It's like 0.05 pounds per capita. 0.05 pounds. <laughs> Whereas China per person. two pounds or more per person. Two pounds. In, in some parts of Europe uh, and in Asia, it's, it's several pounds. So, so um, a lot of opportunity. Um, so thinking about the Northeast and where we are, we're at the very beginning. There's... Um, Russell spent some more time doing mapping. He'll get into that a little bit, but there's a, a handful of farms, 15 to 20 farms or so, with 30 to 40 acres of trees in the region right now. Uh, um, you know, they're very young, um, and, um, and some of the trees producing 40 to 60 pounds uh, per year, uh, what you might expect from mature trees. And before, some of you came earlier, we were talking about a bit of a cluster of trees within uh, at, at least the Western Mass region, but I'm not sure if it extends out to Eastern Mass or other areas of trees that are planted kind of in the 80s range that are fully mature and fully producing. Um, they're, they're, the nuts are, tend to be a little bit smaller because there's been a lot of improvement over the decades and, and, um, and selecting for bigger, bigger nuts. Uh, so uh, Russell and I are going to talk about our um, plantings, which is... 16 acres of that 30 to 40 acres. Um, so, um, so we'll kind of go into uh, what we've been working on and, uh, and then a little bit about what we're doing, trying to promote it and get more people planting. How many people here uh, are thinking about putting trees in either on a property that they live on or might, might, uh, might work on? So yeah, that's awesome. Some good possibilities. Well, we're really wanting to be advocates for more people planting and, and encouraging, and then also figuring out what kind of infrastructure needs to be in place uh, for marketing, processing, and all that. Okay, so um, um, another 12 acres under contract. So, Russell, you'll talk about that yeah. some later, some um, initiatives that Russell has in New York. Um, so, um, um, prices there a little bit. So, from $5 a pound, pick your own, uh, going up as high as $11 a pound retail, wholesale numbers around $5. Uh, there's some really interesting models of, uh, of, of ways that people are marketing. Um, uh, and I think we'll get this a little bit, but very few people are doing any processing because the fresh market is so strong and not even being filled right now. Fresh uh, whole chestnuts. Um, do, you, do you have Locally, uh, so in Albany, the food co-op there sells at eleven ninety nine. Um, that's the only consistent source of flour I buy most of my mail order. Yeah, you can go to Empire Chestnut, and his is he's selling more like fifteen or eighteen a yeah. pound or something. Oh, wow. When you said the selling, is that just around Christmas when everyone's roasting chestnuts, or is it all year? Well, generally they sell out. At Christmas. Yeah, that whole fall, you know, from the harvest is happening September, October, and then the selling out November, December. Um, and so most places are doing, you're either processing it uh, or, or either selling it or processing it into something else, or drying or flowers or such. So we're going to do a little bit of that yeah. later on, though, the um, marketing. So, so there's some stressors, some... Um, but they're not, they're not that huge. Um, blight, we talked about a little bit, uh, whereas blight can still affect some of these hybrids, uh, but generally won't kill them. There's a lot of selection still happening on them. Yeah, 
Yeah, so we just wanted to hit a little bit on some of the distribution here regionally. Um, I offered this before we got started, but this is a live link um, on Google My Maps that I've built out. Happy to share it with anyone. I'll be, we'll have the email or our email addresses at the end of the presentation. Um, this is specifically listing folks who are growing chestnuts and looking to sell the nuts commercially. There are also, as Jono was saying, trees all over the Northeast that are as old as 40 or 50 years old, generally Chinese hybrids. Um, I have been also mapping those, so kind of these uh, specimen trees and trying to track when, for example, their uh, larger nut size are from those trees or it's a particularly productive tree year over year. So we have some of that data. I'm happy for that to become uh, kind of like a citizen science project for anyone who's interested in contributing to it. So just feel free to reach out. Um, I know it's a little hard to pick up all, all this data um, just looking at it this way, but just want to give a sense of the distribution. Um, and also, I'm sure I've missed some, so if you know about someone who isn't on here, we'd love to know about it. Uh, but as you can see, fairly uh, small scattering of farms across the whole Northeast for um, you know, a food source that at one point provided between 30 and 35% of the mass in eastern forests. You know, so... This would be the equivalent of, like, if corn got wiped out or beef got wiped out, and this was all that was left in our region um, in terms of the food source for the human-inclusive ecosystem. Um, and this is just an example. We were talking about this a little bit before we got started, too. There is kind of a buzz, um, and I think some of this is around, you know, the buzz around the role trees can play in uh, responding to climate change and the loss of trees, particularly in temperate agricultural systems. Um, but it's also around, I think we're talking about a food source that people have a lot of nostalgia around. You know, even as you just drive through the Northeast, every town has a chestnut street. But that doesn't mean uh, chestnut still holds the same place in our cuisine that it once did. And so I think there is kind of some connection that people want to have to this food. Um, these are just some examples. We had a brunch last year in April that was a bit of a community gathering um, there's a number of farmers, journalists, and just kind of interested folks in the Amherst area. Um, we're talking about expanding that event this year for a second annual chestnut brunch um, to be able to really be building this conversation. And um, we had, I don't know, maybe 20 different dishes that had chestnuts in them, crepes, porridges, uh, cakes, cakes, beef, beef. Uh, we did a brisket miso chestnut braise, um, really delicious food. Okay. And out of that, actually, a number of the journalists who were there then went and wrote articles. So we had an article in the Wall Street Journal called uh, Let's Farm Chestnuts Again. Uh, this is Lisa DiPiano here um, talking about the Silvo Pasture site at UMass and Jono's site that was in maybe the Washington Post. That was in the Post. Gazette. Gazette? Okay. That was in the Gazette, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, she, she used to work for the Washington Post. Yes. And then Jono just was featured recently in Christian that Science Monitor. Christian Science Monitor. Um, this beautiful drone shot of his farm came out of that, or was in that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's we. What I think is exciting for both of us is every time we talk about this in a public space, or for me, every time I tell a new friend about what we're doing, there is an excitement and a certain energy around this as a regionally appropriate response to climate change and a lot of our other challenges. Johnny, you want to share a little bit about Big River? Yeah. So we'll kind of dig into uh, the two projects that we've been working on and through that talk a little bit about establishment, about the characteristics of the trees, uh, give you some details um, on that. So so this is the uh, property that I'm leasing in Sunderland, which is along the river, the Connecticut River. Uh, it's the on this big river terrace, as you can see, below Mount Sugarloaf, uh, on this terrace, surrounded by fairly traditional agriculture, uh, uh, mostly conventional, though there is Riverland Farm, uh, and it's organic, um, some fields over here, um, but otherwise surrounded by very conventional agriculture. Uh, and it has the, a little bit of the riparian buffer, but it's really not that much, uh, and really not what could be or should be along a big river like this with um, this kind of dynamic uh, flooding and, and back channels. Uh, this is actually a back channel here. So you can get a little bit of a sense of the layout here. The rows of trees uh, which are coming 
uh, up and down this way here, uh, and and the spacing that block there is is the seven acres, and where our goal is to um, be developing this as an alley cropping uh, integrated alley cropping system, which means crops in between the um, the tree rows and uh, rotational grazing for now chickens, uh, with the potential of some future grazing uh, of other. Uh, livestock as the trees get established. Uh, so this is a little bit of a graphic that we did. This is actually part of the SARE grant, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit that we got uh, um, on soil health and monitoring soil health because there's a lot of work happening in the annual agriculture, um, annual cropping sphere with um, how do you build soil health, how do you monitor it, which, which practices are helping to build soil health. But in perennial cropping, uh, and, and even more so integrated cropping and, and agroforestry systems, there's been less documentation and definitely less documentation in the Northeast on um, what, what really works in our regional uh, uh, climate system. So this, uh, it's hard to read from there, I think, but it's a bit of a graphic showing that we have the riparian buffer along the river. There's actually a back channel uh, to the river, a small swale that's, creating these opportunities for kind of what we call productive conservation or a productive buffer. So essentially, <clears throat> because we're surrounded by water, this is a place where whatever agriculture is happening here is affecting the water quality uh, of, on this um, seasonal stream and the, and the river. Uh, so it's a, it's a productive buffer um, opportunity where we're showing um, alley cropping, the tree rows, and the... Um, um, growing of crops in purple in between the tree rows uh, and the movement of the chickens. I'll have a little image of that. Uh, and then a more widely spaced tree setup, uh, which we might get to in the future, really in the more like 15, 20 year range where the um, trees are spaced wider and then we could have some livestock in between, larger livestock than just chickens. Um, at this point, uh, we don't want to protect every individual tree from a... Um, uh, like cattle, uh, the potentials there. And so, uh, okay, so let's keep going. So uh, a little bit about where where are the best sites for growing chestnuts, and we're looking at hardiness zone 4 through 8, so that covers pretty much all of the region. There's maybe some far northern parts of the northeast uh, that get into zone 3. Uh, they... Um, that would be too cold, but, but right here in this sort of central zone where in Ma all of Massachusetts is prime uh, climate zone. And they can really, they can handle the hot summers uh, as well. Uh, they need well-drained soil, uh, has to be able to drain, can't have uh, a high water table. Um, and that's something that I'm dealing with a little bit. My prop, the land that I'm farming on that river terrace has a somewhat heavier soil uh, and some, some wetter zones. So I'm sort of pushing the edges of that. Um, and they can handle some really tough growing conditions going up into some of hillsides um, and, and um, really um, sandy, gravelly soils as well that get a little bit droughty um, once they're established. So we'll talk a little bit about establishment uh, too. Uh, they need to be acidic, 5.5 to 6.5. Uh, slopes can, can vary uh, quite a bit. Uh, sometimes a slope can actually be beneficial, so when, uh, um, it's, it's not that um, a slope can actually be used to help with both airflow, uh, but also even with uh, harvesting, if we have a chance to get into some of some interesting things with using slope to help with uh, harvesting the nuts. Um, they need full sunlight for sure, uh, and then um, other factors about access is really important to keep consideration of um, management needs and harvest of, at some point, being able to come in and get to the trees and um, be able to um, have access underneath, have access around them, and, and to have a harvest. So a little bit about leasing. Um, is there anybody here who's, who's looking at a leasing situation, would be leasing? Nobody. Wow. Most of the people do it on their own land. Okay. Well, maybe you might think about somebody who was going to come in and have a lease. Um, uh, because that is another option. I um, have a lease 
on the property. Um, so this is a little bit about the elements of the lease that I negotiated. We spent a lot of time trying to find some information about long-term leases, since there's a lot about year-to-year -year leases or two-year leases or five-year leases. But with trees, it really has to be longer. There's some really great information put out by Farm Commons and the Savannah Institute. Savannah Institute, who I was mentioning earlier, for people who came early, the Midwest organization that's doing a lot of work um, on, uh, on developing tree crops in the Midwest. Um, and so we worked off of this workbook uh, to develop a lease. Uh, right now, um, I have a 20-year lease with a right to renew, um, and I'm kind of in the negotiation of a potential purchase, uh, being complicated by the fact that it's under APR. And so uh, we're having conversations between myself, the landowners, and MDAR uh, um, that are getting kind of complicated for, for how, how that would work. Um, so um, the lease is a really important. We have outlined fairly specifically what is permitted and what's excluded. Uh, it's pretty open as far as the things I do related to farming. Pretty much anything can happen there, but it's, but it's really it's being clear uh, that it's not, um, there's no camping allowed, and, um, no events. Um, it's not a, really meant to be an event space, that kind of thing. Um, we have a, a rent fee that's established, uh, and then it has a, um, a system for increasing um, from a base lease fee uh, depending on other expenses or increases in, in taxes and uh, other, other expenses that the landowner might uh, experience. Um, a, the ability to transfer my right of interest because I'm investing in the trees uh, without even getting their approval right to sublet, so some of the other operations we have on there are like the chickens is another guy who's doing his operation. I'll show you a picture of that. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility that I have. Um, I have the first right of refusal, as I mentioned, but it is kind of complicated because of the MDAR. Um, they have actual first right of refusal on a sale of the property. Um, so it's a little dance happening there. Um, and there's a pretty stiff penalty written into it for the landowner breaking the lease. Because me, as a, as a leasee, um, and I'm investing a considerable amount uh, to get trees established and care for them year after year, there needs to be a protection, from my standpoint, for the grower, for the person who's putting that in um, to help, help protect that, um, that investment. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to release information you're not comfortable with, but what are rental fees in our valley like? Uh, yeah, I could say my, the, the uh, I don't know, well, I know sale of property values more so. Lease fees could be anywhere per acre, uh, could be $100 an acre per year, could go up to 500 an acre per year, kind of, it depends on a lot of different things. The lease that I'm paying, it actually includes two barns, uh, one that's the old farm stand that's been improved at this point, uh, and another that's really defunct, um, and I'm paying, I pay 4900 a year, so it's 10 acres, 7 acres of property, but but then, then I'm subletting to the guy, for one person using the shop, and another grower, and I'm subletting the other barn to another person. Actually, and I'm subletting to a, another farm that is using a little portion of the land for their equipment and irrigation access on the river. So, can I, can I add something? Yes, go for it. Um, I think it also depends a lot on land use and location in the valley. So, for example, John was in River, river Valley, you know, flat soils, prime, veg production zone. Um, I've talked to folks higher up in like Shelburne, Coleraine, who, you know, for the landowner, they're doing them a favor by paying it, right? And they don't even pay a lease fee. They're just, they just have a hang lease. Um, Might be helping them stay in APR. In APR exactly. Okay, so 61A. Yeah, 61A, exactly. yeah. So, so there's I, these other benefits. I think there is huge variation, um, but yeah. certainly where you're, where you're growing is the, some of the most expensive yeah. land in yeah. the valley. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an arrangement where if the, if the landowner were to terminate the lease, they would buy your trees from you, or how is that? Element yes, there's a, a penalty. When I use the word penalty here, it means money. Uh, where the trees have a value, uh, and then every year they're increasing in value. So I can't remember off the top of my head, it was, but it was considerable per, you know, per acre. After five to ten years, once the trees are in production, the, the per acre value that somebody that I would have to be paid out is a lot. You know, so so it's meant to be um, a pretty serious contract that protect my interests, um, and this is, becomes the hard part that we've experienced is we're trying to find more people either to allow somebody to come onto their land and grow chestnuts, or more landowners, it's a little more straightforward, I'm a landowner, I'm going to grow chestnuts, but if you have land and you are thinking about having, inviting somebody on to grow, but we're talking, you know, 50, 50 years is really kind of a minimum. Um, so it's a long-term commitment. Mm -hmm. What Russell brought up is a great point, though, that the chestnuts don't need to be planted in the valleys, so a lot more trees could be planted in, in unfavorable soils. Definitely. And there would be a lot more trees. Yeah. And this is, so, so my valley bottom project is not the best example as far as siting. It's very good because it's central. It has a central location, and it could come in handy in some sort of scenario where we're aggregating uh, nuts and, and um, doing some shared marketing amongst a bunch of people because it's a because it's a good location in that way. It's not a necessity and, and maybe not even desirable to, to be in really the prime valley bottom soils. Though I will say a tree crop as far as a riparian buffer, if if you look at this, you know, really these it would be better in this proximity to this river here, it would be better to have a perennial crop here, something that's got roots in the soil and is holding than this action in the valley bottoms, in these river zones. So, not necessarily chestnuts, but other other perennial crops really should be happening in my opinion. Uh, Alright, let's keep keep going. Dig into the long turf, please. Uh, how are we doing on our time? You're at 2.30, so okay. I think we're right on target. Perfect. Uh, so, thinking a little bit about spacing and layout, these, the trees are 30 to 50 feet high, 40 to 60 feet wide. You can see this is at the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station that we were mentioning, uh, the named Lockwood variety um, uh, from the, the, What's the, the guy's the name who, who was Graves? Graves, Graves, original researcher yeah. who did a lot of work early in the, through the 20th century. Um, so you can see here, some of these trees will get to be quite large and um, can be some control with pruning uh, is possible. But uh, and here's uh, in uh, Florida a, a shot of a fairly clean orchard setting with trees, probably more like a 20 by 20 spacing. So so options with spacing from 20 to 20, which is a very close spacing, going up to 40 foot. Spacing 40 feet or more if you were doing a civil pasture thing. Some, one strategy is the closer spacing allows the trees to come into production sooner because they're wind pollinated and the closer they are, uh, the quicker they're going to start producing pollen. You're going to start getting a crop sooner. Uh, the downside of that is the need to cut trees out and, and fairly rigidly. And we've visited, I think, a lot of different chestnut plantings where people have gotten fond of their trees and have a hard time uh, cutting cutting their trees that they've cared for for decades and, and being a little cutthroat about it and making space for them. Um, and so you see a lot of overgrown um, where they're really growing way into each other and inhibiting uh, the ability of each individual tree to produce. Um, so there's the, the 20 by 20 is just a succession phase uh, and then, and then it would go up from there, um, and really uh, thinking about. Can you give a couple questions. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't even look like a chestnut tree on the right. What is that? That's a chestnut mm -hmm. tree. That's yeah. Lockwood Chinese rice. Chinese chestnut. Chinese, tree. yeah, yeah. Selected varieties. It doesn't look like mine. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite 
Oh, what, and just because of the shape of the tree or the bark? Yeah, the, the fact that it's grown up so perpendicular rather yeah. than the flowering branches that go to the Yeah, top. yeah, yeah. It may have some European genetics. There's actually a map for that site that maps all the genetic diversity yeah, of it. But it's definitely a chestnut tree. Mm -hmm. How old is that tree? I would guess 45 to 50 years old, but I'm not, I'm not certain. This was in a side block. It's that's actually pretty nice. incredible, the work that's been done. <laughs> it's definitely a chestnut tree. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of diversity within them. I guess. And at this experiment station, part of the work was doing these different kinds of crosses and growing out these different kinds of trees. So when you're going through, I highly advise visiting this, um, this place. And there's a great map. And some of the trees, these very special trees that Sandra plus the guy Graves, who yeah. she was working for and studied with and then kind of took over for, they did some like really intense crosses yeah. and back crosses with so there's some trees that have six different species of chestnut genetics within them. How do you get to go visit there? Uh, it's open. Yeah, it's open public. to the public. It's open to the public. So as long as the gates are open, you can go. Yeah. Be careful about getting locked in, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And actually, just a little bit to add to your question about how different it looks. There are, depending on which researcher you're talking to, there's as many as seven different species of chestnuts that are everywhere from what would look like, you know, basically a big blueberry bush in scale to uh, 80 to 120 feet tall and 10 feet in diameter. So there is a really wide genetic base of what it, what a quote-unquote chestnut is. So I, that might be why you're seeing something that doesn't look familiar. Yeah. yeah the chinkapin species are sh sh multi-stem shrubs slash small trees. Quite, quite beautiful. Mm-hmm. Might be jumping the gun, but other than the block pattern, are you going to discuss other? I mean, being wind pollinated, can you plant one row, field edges, wind breaks, integrated into other forest canopies? Would you get pollination? Is it? Yes. You know? It's a good question. We won't get into too much, but it's definitely a need to have a cluster of trees close enough together uh, for pollination. Uh, so, you know, wind break, you know, something a little bit like we did a while back at your place, you know, having a group uh, close enough and enough uh, differentiation in the varieties uh, to get good pollination. Variety difference, not necessarily species uh, difference. So, so they don't have to be in rows, but I'm, I'm a pretty big believer, even if they're in smaller blocks or a single row or two rows, that, uh, you know, there's, there's a you get into management and harvest needs eventually and where you're really going to need to get in and um, um, be able to get to the um, ground layer and um, be able to pick up and mow or keep it clean enough so that you can find the nuts because they're falling to the ground uh, in order to be harvested. Um, so, so there's important considerations around access that way. And that's, that's the reason for um, lots Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do between the moment you plant them and 20 years or whatever, 15 years <laughs> after? Perfect segue. <laughs> yes, exactly. So there's a lot of space. And here, where, where I planted, the rows are 40 feet apart. So I could go, there's that 20 foot. So here, as you can barely see, the um, gray, this is a welded wire cage protecting a tree. So there's a row there. Here's a row with a tree tube, tree tube, uh, that way. So here's that 20-foot spacing, and there could be a row in the middle here. Uh, but what I've opted to do is, in some cases, planting 20 and 30 feet within the row. So they're a little bit tight in the row, and they're going to have to get thinned out eventually within the row. But between the rows, I'm developing an uh, intercropping uh, system, or alley cropping. And so where you can see the um, tractor uh, truck wheel paths, uh, you can't quite see, but there's mulched planting spaces. And there's a row of, um, I've done both elderberry and aronia in this pattern. So I think this is the aronia. I'm not totally sure. I think it's the elderberry. I think it's the elderberry here. I was going to say and there's the elderberry. Like that's elderberry. And there's the elderberry. There's the elderberry flower in poor resolution. But... But basically, there's two rows of small fruit, elderberry and aronia, with a 10-foot space between them. So once they grow, they're six feet wide. 
uh, there'll be a room for just basically one small mowing width in between the two fruit rows, which are in the alley of the trees, and they've got 10 to 15 years or so of full sun, and then there'll be increasingly more and more shade at, you know, each year. Um, eventually, these trees with a 40-foot crown, the crowns will be right out to the middle. So that's to answer your question. This is one pattern with tons of different options of intercropping, lots of different possibilities. So I have small fruit, and then I'm also doing, um, those are with the two rows, and then I'm also doing, I've actually pulled back from the pawpaws, and they're in another block together in a different area, uh, but the persimmon are in an alley, but only down one center row down the middle. Um, and so, um, so they'll, they'll have more space for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. What was your decision making for pulling the pump out? Uh, I have this wet area of the field, so an opportunity area. Um, it's, it's seasonally wet uh, that I think that the pawpaws will do fine in. Um, and uh, what else? Yeah, just getting a little bit. There's also like the gauge here for me is the input that I'm going to take on a tree in the alley and the years it's going to take to come up, and it's a bit of like a race, because I also want the chestnuts to grow fast and start producing, meaning taking up more space, but I'm limiting, but I actually don't, wouldn't want them where there's a block of intercrop trees. Um, I, so so the, tree, the tree intercrop is a little bit more of a question for me. Um, so, so that's, I pulled the um, pawpaws and put them in a different spot. Um, and, uh, and it kind of seems to work well. And the persimmons, I think it'll, it'll work fine because those will come into um, production in three years. So this gets a little bit into the succession plan. So chestnuts, you're really like four to seven years to really kick in to production and then really maybe 10 to 12 years to where it's substantial. I'll show you some numbers. Um, well, just at least the financial numbers. But that's, you know depending on varieties, depending on site. but um, so, so that's the longer term. It's going to take longer to start to pull its weight financially. So I have this middle term crop of small fruit and fruit trees that um, the elderberries are flowering in year one, and so did the aronia too. And I had goji berry. I have some goji berry in the alley. I'm just like, tend to start throwing things in. But um, those should be in production in two years, for sure, some, by three years considerable production. And then the year one, right from the beginning, is the ability to have some income from uh, chicken, a chicken operation. So there's a succession plan here. Whereas, so not having to just wait and just sort of sitting and twiddling thumbs, but to utilize the land and create more niches of opportunity. Uh, the chickens is kind of a sublet. So Martin who and his, and his son... Uh, and my dog, um, taking care of the chicks, which were on the grass from day one, right after they were hatched uh, and raised on, on the um, ground, uh, and then eventually moved from uh, um, kind of a rolling chick house to a uh, um, rotational grazing system uh, that he was kind of uh, figuring out on the fly, which is kind of amazing here. And so moving them up and down the rows, here's the rows of of uh, trees and um, and moving them up and down the rows and sort of spreading out both the, um, the tillage effect and also the manuring uh, through the alleys there. And so the goal is that was, uh, I think he did about 300 birds this year, and I think he's um, aiming to expand that considerably this year and have several different um, areas where they're rotating the birds through. Very successful. So um, the project that uh, Russell mentioned, uh, um, the civil pasture work that's happening at UMass, which is a somewhat smaller planting, um, a little bit more experimental, a little bit trialing it out, um, and then being able to um, watch it and do some experiments um, or, or documentation of how it's going with the uh, sheep uh, and, and using the flexinet in between the rows and grazing the sheep there 
uh, primarily using the tree tubes. We'll get into that a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, the different options for protecting them. Um, but I think it's going going pretty well. Do you want to say anything getting that yeah, trees established? Yeah, I mean, pretty anecdotal data so far. This will be, this was just the second growing season. Um, it's on about an acre. And really the only issue so far that has put the trees at risk is, is user error. It's just when someone stakes the electronet. Uh, a little too close to the trees. The, the sheep haven't, you know, fought through the net to go get a tree. Um, and another thing is this is a long-time haying site, and just, again, anecdotally, the, the small area that the sheep hit compared to the hay fields was the biomass production early this spring was much higher. Um, so I think even just being able to show that side by side, especially if you're talk, working with, say, an upland farmer and replacing haying land with Silo pasture uh, as an alternative. I think there's even a chance to make the argument around just increasing fertility and production of that field. Yeah, um, and it really a need to document this these kind of changes. And I think it's also been an amazing learning and kind of uh, publicity opportunity for the campus. They've now had two straight years of what they call the cool climate meal at UMass, where they actually served lamb from the silo pasture site as a carbon farming dish, um, and you know few thousand students interacted with that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the stocking rate is between the rows? Mm. Uh, I know that last year they only had six lambs. I'm trying to think. I think this year they might have gone to ten. Um, and they, so these are 30 foot spacing in row. And really and I just think they were like 20 or I so I can't feet. remember how frequently they were moving. But, yeah, it was a very small herd. <laughs> that's the thing. It's, yeah. it's a small flock. It's a small area, the total planting. Yeah. But that's about, it's like less than 20 feet going this way and, and yeah. 60 feet going that way. I would guess it was probably about 200 feet of uh, fencing total. So, like, yeah. I don't know, like 75 length, 25 width. Yeah. So, pretty small. So... You know, getting there and getting more examples of, exactly. of what, how this actually works and what's successful. Uh, so just a couple minutes on the um, vegetation management, fertility management in the field here. Um, I'm mostly doing um, different kind of mowing patterns in the alleyways where I don't have the small fruit. Uh, trying to allow a lot of the regrowth. That's, um, this is a field that was fallow for five years and then it was in annuals previous to that. So uh, the really low organic matter levels, pretty high density, pretty high compaction of a heavy silt soil, uh, thus a little bit holding, holding more water than is ideal. Um, so letting a lot of the vegetation go through pulses of growth and then mowing it down uh, and trying to get the um, kind of the um, wheel going of the, um, the um, um, growth of the um, carbon cycling. Um, and, and then in addition to that kind of mowing management, adding a lot of inoculants. I have this fertigation setup uh, that, that's going pretty well with a tank. It's a 60-gallon tank on the trailer. And then being able to put in inoculants and the fish hydrozate and kelp. Um, amendments not, aren't going in there. Those are added by hand. And then I have a sprayer that, that um, I just pulled out the window of the truck and uh, can spray down each tree and around the base of the tree. So it's a one-person operation, um, the, whole, the whole thing together. Um, and so, um, so in addition to doing mulching and using wood chips uh, and, and, and having that, that mowing is also bringing down a lot of carbon and even some woody kind of carbon stems uh, to try and um, get, get more organic matter uh, and, and more for the the whole biology, soil biology cycle kicked in. And so the, the grant that we got, the SARE uh, partnership grant for this year and next year, um, will be doing the same practices, uh, these kind of what I think are regenerative practices. Uh, you know, we're also cover cropping uh, and using some compost and, and um, uh, vermicompost. Uh, and then measuring and trying to real, we've done some um, good baseline measurements of the field and the conditions, uh, and then we've been measuring along the way. We have um, uh, CARO uh, is doing the um, NOFA proxy testing, 
Um, so we have two years of data even before this starts, the SARE grant, and then we'll have two years of the SARE grant. Uh, and then we're also using um, testing, a pretty complete testing through Cornell called the CASH protocol, um, complete something of soil health, complete assessment of soil health, um, as well as the Logan Labs for just for fertility monitoring. So we're really trying to, and then the goal would be to be able to tease out, are these regenerative, which, which practices, or are these practices um, changing the soil? And already from um, 2018 testing by Caro and the, and the carbon proxy, and then this year she um, documented, which I think we need to test more in the field, to see that just this practice is in one year, the, um, the, um, uh, the bulk densities dropped considerably. The, the compaction level, how dense the soil is, uh, went down. This is only, though, for one test in one place on the field. Uh, and also the drainage times uh, um, increased where the soil was holding water. And it was taking a long time, and then we had this uh, a very rapid drainage test. But, but I feel like we need to replicate, do that test in a few spots um, to see uh, just because of the way they're testing. See. Mm -hmm. What tree tubes did you use in time to how high are they? Yeah, I'm going to let Russell get into that in a moment here, and we'll talk, we'll talk tree tubes. That's, that's you, five foot tree tubes. Just for reference for my thread, is that is your plant That's Plantra. Right. Yep, that's a five foot Plantra brand tube. All right, so quick, because we're already... You might want to... All right, so, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go... These are just the, the numbers of implementation year one costs that you can read. But the bottom line here, total expenses, a little over 20000 a little bit of that income from all that subletting that I was talking. This is really the number to key in on. Russell will have some numbers from his as well. So we're doing some good financial documentation. This, this, that cost per acre for year one implementation, um, I'm hoping that the cost, the management cost is closer to 1000 an acre. Um, but I actually need to calculate what I spent this year. Um, to figure out year two. Um, so I have some, from some of my numbers that I've worked out, the goal is um, that we will have prof, year by year profit in year five to eight. That means we're just paying for those year by year expenses. Uh, and then, um, then really the payback that's paying back all this initial expense somewhere in year 12 maybe 12 to 15, you know, as it goes. Um, and so these all depend really on which numbers you're including in and your lease fees or mortgages or equipment costs and how they get spread out. But that just gives you some feeling of um, some numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, just to clarify, is that that's your break-even point is in year 12 to 18? Well, no. Well, I have a break-even my year by year, and it depends on how you calculate this. This is sort of an expense, you know, owed money that's that's a debt, you know, wherever that money comes from. But I don't have that as a debt that I need to pay back, plus years two, three, four, up to five. So the year by year, I'm starting to turn a yearly profit on the yearly expenses. Yeah. But not the payback on the debt is going to take some quite a bit longer. Okay. Yeah. Return on investment. What's twenty five pounds of tree? That's that's an assumption. That's these are just like numbers. That if I'm up to twenty five pounds on every tree. From, of nuts. Nuts. Twenty five pounds of nuts on every tree. Okay. Yes, that's what we're trying to do. This doesn't include these other. I have to say also, it doesn't include necessarily the other um, businesses that are. Well, and so it's possible that with the, you know, the elderberries kick in and the aronia and start to do really well, the chickens start, maybe the chickens start to bring the year, year by year profitability down to year three, and then um, the other operations year nine. So stay tuned. The numbers, you know, I saw my it's forte. Conservative. It's, it's very conservative. conservative. And, and so there's, it's too, still to be worked out. Mm -hmm. Did you plant your um, trees by seed or? Uh, seedlings, and we'll seedlings. get oh, Russell's so going to cover some of that in a okay. moment. Yeah, he's going to talk about where to get seedlings. Yeah, we're going to talk about where to get them. So let's, let's you're going to take yeah. over, and we're going to. I'll try and move fast enough. Why don't you make sure I finish with 
15 minutes to go. Yeah, but it's good to have, we're having questions along yeah. the way, so. Just in know, case. Yeah, we'll leave some time at the end. All right, how's everyone doing with the hot room with fluorescent lights? Are we awake still? Yeah. All right. Um, so just a couple other examples of types of lease options. Um, I'll get to the top one last, actually, because that's what I'm working with. Um, so I have a colleague in New York who has actually contracted with folks in the Hudson Valley, generally kind of like second homeowners with ag land, to help them hold on to their ag tax incentives that they get through the state by planting trees. So he went in and brush hogged in old fallows, planted trees, and actually is getting paid a cut of that ag tax incentive to be doing this. So he's actually doing it as a service that he's getting paid for just slightly. It's not enough to pay for the establishment, but um, he's not actually paying to be on that land at all. Um, alternatively, uh, Casey Dahl out in Wisconsin is working with um, a grazer on her cattle pasture. He's just renting, I think it's, or leasing 10 foot strips of the pasture. So much like Jono's layout, uh, kind of a, past, a rotational pasture alley cropping system. Um, where he is only leasing the amount of land that his trees are planted on and that he's mulching. So literally the footprint of his project is all he's leasing. Um, and then, of course, purchasing land is an option that um, we, was already mentioned. So my example, um, I am leasing land from Otter Creek Farms out in Rensselaer County. So uh, for those of you who can't see, this is Troy, New York right here. This is the Tom Hannock Reservoir. And then just northeast of there, really in dairy country of Rensselaer County, probably um, from Amherst where we're based, the like highest density of this kind of hilly um, corn, soy, hay, dairy country that we have in the region without going past the Hudson River. Um, and my agreement with the folks at Otter Creek is partially based on that they're a retired dairy. So they're a fifth generation dairy that two years ago stopped milking because they weren't making money anymore. Um, and so they were look, looking to diversify operations on 450 acres. Um, and for them, the options are basically plant corn, soy, or hay, um, and have their neighbor lease from them and manage for feed for their animals, um, which don't, I mean, that's how they've been managing the land for a while, and they see kind of the ecological and stewardship problems with continuing to do that. And there's also just not that much financial upside um, especially if right now you go for a drive through Rensselaer County and see the percentage of those fields that weren't even harvested last year because it was so wet, so continuously wet throughout the season that it was never time to harvest, right? So there, you're, we're starting to get to a point ecologically where there's a reality for farmers managing in this way, even if they want to keep milking, um, that it's just not tenable to be managing the land for these yields. Um, and so... Build, building on that and their desire to have more diversity, their agreement with me and understanding that you know this is the ground level of a new crop industry in the Northeast and that being exciting to them was a revenue share. They understood the value to me of not being having to pay for the land up front. And so I'm only actually going to pay them once yields have started from the chestnuts. They have a 10% revenue share on the chestnut production only. So anything else that's produced on that land um, is 100% revenue to my business. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit risky for me, but um, just in the sense that I'm giving them a fairly large cut in the long term, um, but it is reducing my upfront risk, um, which, as Jonna was just talking about, in terms of uh, the, the time to pay back, it's really worthwhile for me um, as someone who is not particularly cash rich at this moment. Um, so that, that's our current agreement is a revenue share. Um, and this is just uh, this is me with my parents here on the field last May. And this is actually a really interesting uh, nuance about chestnut establishment that I had never had to deal with because I've only ever planted into other people's pasture or abandoned pasture. So I was planting into a conventional cornfield, which meant that last April and May, as the rains were pouring and I wanted to establish a permanent uh, cover there of perennial rye and uh, white clover, I had to wait until the field dried out enough so that it could be distant seeded and that the corn could be kind of uh, tilled back in so we'd have an easier planting medium. So this is what the field looked like last year. Um, and what ended up being a bit of a challenge is that with that delay, we're talking about not being ready to plant 
into the cover until late May or even early June, which is about six weeks later than I would have liked to be planting, um, which then means because it's hot and I'm actually transporting trees out of the Connecticut River Valley to this place, I'm rushing to get the trees in the ground, which means I'm not taking the time to put on vole protection. And then when it snows earlier than expected this winter and I don't have all the vole protection on, the voles hit a little harder. So learning all the lessons of, of why timing is so important and why understanding every specific situation is really important. Um, I'll talk in a second about that we're going to be expanding another 12 acres uh, in 2020. That's going to be a fall planting. Uh, I just learned the lesson of having to rush into um, you know, what was already tilled ground uh, and it just not being worth it for me to plant in the spring. There's just too many risks. So this is the end of the fall here after about 700 trees were in the ground. And you can see uh, here is the edge of the soy field. So we have um, what was corn last year planted into uh, clover, rye, and chestnuts, and about 20 different other species, maybe more, that emerged, um, you know, because there wasn't Roundup being sprayed on them anymore. Um, and just a really amazing kind of anecdote was I've never had I've never had the juxtaposition side by side to go stand on the edge of the soy field and go like this you know, soy field, listening to hear what I hear, and then going like this and hearing, you know, 30 different species, perennial crops, all sorts of weeds that are flowering. Mm -hmm. And the, just the difference in sound is kind of amazing. It, like, brings tears to your eyes to hear the difference of that sound and to and think... temperature, too. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, especially in July. Yeah. Um, so that, that was an interesting anecdote, and luckily that soy will be planted next year. Um, so I'll just zoom back out here. So... Purple was planted this year. That was about seven and a half acres. Green square here is another 12 acres that was in soy this year. Soy that went unharvested may not ever get harvested. Um, so next year we might just be disking the soy back in because it was so wet again. Uh, and so we'll be at about 20 acres planted, hopefully by the end of November 2020. Pretty exciting. Um, and then in terms of the genetics and the trees we're planting, so... I personally am not planting any grafted cultivars. Um, there is a little bit of discussion about this depending on where you are nationally, but generally for the eastern U.S. where the main concern is planting trees that are blight resistant, there hasn't been enough consistency within the blight resistant cultivars when moved region to region for it to make sense to plant cultivars instead of seedlings. Um, so just to say a little bit more about that, there are folks, for example, in Michigan that are almost entirely a grafted clone industry, but I've talked to the folks at University of Missouri or the largest uh, producers in Ohio that are doing about 90 acres, thousands of pounds of chestnuts, and they all agree that Missouri has a cultivar trial orchard, and they'll tell you, if you take our cultivar trials, the ones that have done the best, and plant them even just in Iowa, which is very close compared to Massachusetts, there's no guarantee that the best cultivars in Missouri will do well in Iowa. That's what, they, that's what they've found. And even worse, they've had instances of graft failure at like year 15. So even if that tree's a great producer, the graft fails, you've lost fi basically 15 years, right? And there's no proof that taking cuttings off that graft failure is actually going to result in good yields either. So for the Northeast, there are folks who have planted cultivars, and I'm excited to see John, you did some. I have a handful of, of grafted varieties, and then there's this Dunstan, which is a cross, actually. Yeah. And um, so, and I think it's worth it to just yeah. see. Yeah. But I, if I'm planting 700 trees, the best wisdom it seems like for the Northeast is to go with seedling genetics. So, meaning every tree is genetically unique, which means some of them will be bus and often those out, and some of them will be great producers. Um, yeah. Did you plant at a higher density? Yeah, great question. So um, all seedlings I planted at 13 feet in row, 30 feet between rows, um, with the thought that basically two-thirds of those trees will be thinned out over the next 15 to 20 years. These are Chinese? These are Chinese genetics, yeah. They're, they're technically complex genetics because they're from an orchard that has multiple species, but overwhelmingly Chinese, yeah. Um, and just a note up here, a few different sellers... Um, Empire Chestnuts in Ohio is using the same genetics from the Missouri Orchard Trials and then breeding their own seedlings out of those. Um, they've had trees planted for 30 years. They're digging them up, 
cutting them down and digging them up and replacing them with the newer generations of seedlings because they're that confident that this generation is going to be more productive. So even with 30-year-old trees that are somewhat productive, we just we are getting impro enough improvement that it's worth planting this newer generation. Uh, Red Fern Farms in Iowa, as Jono mentioned, Perfect Circle Farms is Buzz Fervor's farm in Vermont, and then Twisted Trees, Akiva Silver out in the Finger Lakes. And those are specifically for selling trees, so seedling trees. Did you want to add something? Can I just add, so I, so I remember, Buzz Fervor from Perfect Circle Farms is coming to do a NOFA sponsored workshop at my place in, on April 5th. If you're on the NOFA, you'll see it, but it's a, it's a one day workshop on Sunday, April 5th in Sunderland. Um, that'll be, well, actually, I don't know if it's free. <laughs> I'm not really sure if I know if it's that. It up. may not be free. It yeah. may not be free. It's a NOFA sponsored thing. On but chestnut growing? It's on propagation, not tree propagation. So here is just an image of the seedling nursery I set up uh, before I had access to land. I actually didn't even meet the folks I'm growing with until April of last year. So we really sped into our contract. Um, so I actually um, bought some trees from Empire that um, someone had kind of backed out of a deal with Greg there. And he was looking to sell a bunch of trees and so I could get them on discount. Uh, so I drove out to Ohio and back to save on shipping and planted 700 trees in a friend's backyard just to save a few thousand bucks. Um, not sure if it was worth the risk. Uh, it, met, it means that they were transplanted twice, which probably the trees weren't that pumped about, but we'll see. Uh, in terms of seed genetics, uh, regionally productive trees are a free source of seedling genetics. You know, what we're trying to do is establish a pool of genetics that work in this place. So finding a tree that is healthy and loving living in this place and producing well is a great source. There are some really good ones at the Ag Experiment Station that Jono mentioned in uh, Hamden, Connecticut. And then I've actually started buying most of my seed from the University of Missouri's cultivar trials directly. Um, it's between five and ten bucks a pound, depending on if you want the name of the mother tree associated with it, or just want bulk from their best cultivars. Um, and that, that's what I'm showing here is actually the stratification process. So um, over the past two years, I've probably bought 7,000 seeds, something like that, um, and buried them in moist sand in, you know, standard five-gallon buckets, uh, bury them about 18 inches below the surface, leave them there for the winter, um, as long as they don't freeze solid. I've had, last year I did it this way and had about 98% germination rate. Um, that doesn't mean all those turned into seedlings, but in, in terms of shooting out a radical, about 98%, um, which was really exciting. And then again, uh, you can buy nuts harvested from Greg's Farm, Empire Chestnuts, Red Fern, and Red Fern in Iowa. Although they tend to sell out fresh, so I don't know how many they're mailing. And then Twisted Tree again are all some of the kind of commercial seed sources. Yeah. Wait, were you the one who had that like YouTube video about your like stratifying system with the buckets? I that's Akiva. That's Akiva at Twisted Tree, and that's who I'm copying oh, okay. here. Yeah. Okay, so it's the same. More system. hair. Yeah. Akiva's a more charismatic YouTube personality than I am. Yeah. What would be the uh, most cold-hardy uh, seed source that you know of? The most cold-hardy seed cold. source would probably... I don't know anyone really north of Greenfield. Buzz. But Buzz is doing seedling production in almost northern Vermont. Is he north of Burlington? Oh, did you say north of Burlington? He's, he's, in, no, he's not north of Burlington. Well, there's the not... Does um, who are the nut growers in um in Canada? Do they carry any chestnuts? It's, I'm not uh, sure. What's his name? Um, I, th I think Buzz would be the best bet for chestnuts. Yeah, you should check though. Like There's yeah, I bought it from um, oh my god, Grimo is the guy who grows great trees in Canada, and then yes. then there's a young guy. You're not him, are you? They, they're, they're, sorry, Nutcracker, Nutcracker Nurseries, or the young guy who took off. So I would contact them yeah. as a source. Canada. And then I would also contact Buzz, yeah. who's not necessarily he's, selling seed. Yeah, he's nuts. not producing seed yet, but he's harvesting from a wide array of genetics and yeah. then do, has nursery production in, I'd say, halfway up Vermont? I mean, he's yeah, yeah. about as far north as anyone in the U.S. <laughs> um, and, then, and then this Facebook group. I mean, it's the kind of group where you just put that question out and there's just some great minds 
you know, who would chime in. Of course, a lot of those people live in California. And, um, you know, are showing these amazing... I, and then a quick little uh, note here. Something I found with producing your own trees is that bed prep really matters. So I had trees this year in kind of recently moved out of Fallow's land that had no mulch on it, just bare soil. I'd say 80% of them burnt. You know, they re-sprouted and they might do okay. But compared to these trees, which are, this is actually towards the end of the first year. Um, some of them are almost at four feet tall. And they were in an old sheet mulch bed at, at the UMass Old Food Forest. So, you know, like eight inches of really nice soil. And then we put mulch on top of these seeds. And those, the tallest one that I planted this year, that was a two-year-old seedling from that site, was probably five and a half feet tall. And this is an example of the roots I was getting on these. Um, really well colonated by mycorrhizal fungi. Um, nice, some roots like half an inch to, to like three quarters of an inch in diameter on a two-year-old tree. So, I mean, like, really productive growth and just kind of the trees in the bare soil paled in comparison. So, um, definitely learn the lesson about mulching the seeds if you're going to be producing. Um, at a bare minimum, I, I would just throw some chips over top. Um, talking about tree protection, I've tried three different uh, strategies at Bread Tree this year. We did plantro tubes versus tree pro shelters, um, which the ordering price is basically the same. The major difference I found with them is that the tree pro shelters come as a flat um, structure that has kind of, not perforations, but like ribs built in. And you actually have to fold it and then zip tie it manually before you can put it on the tree, um, which sounds really simple. But when you're planting 700 trees and it takes you like five to ten minutes to actually get that tube done, that really adds up to a lot more cost than a tube that comes and you just kind of pop it and put it over the tree. Uh, the other thing is the tree tubes have just kind of individual manually drilled holes in them, whereas the planter tubes really are kind of a whole perforated column. Um, and it, in general, it seemed like those uh, were moving in the wind better. So it was like, it was kind of less volatile movement in the wind, just, just yeah. kind of watching my, we have very windy days here. Um, and it also seemed like there was less moisture buildup in the tube itself with the planter tubes. And that's so, been an improvement over for the tree tubes in the last 10 to 20 years where they didn't used to have enough ventilation so a lot of the trees would cook inside of them. Um, so they want it to be warmer because you're creating a little microclimate but too warm is not good either. So I'm not told, I can't say I have conclusive evidence but I saw enough of a difference that when I had to buy for my fall planting last year I bought 150 planter tubes and no more tree pro. Um, we'll see. Yeah. Are you doing tree wrap for vole protection on top of this, or just? The you know, the voles haven't bothered any of the trees in tubes. So that was something I was waiting to see. Um, as long as I kind of the tubes are rubbed in there, the the voles aren't going after them. How deep are you? Did you? Like, uh, not more than half an inch. I mean, just kind of like wiggling them in a little bit. Yeah. So you mentioned welded wire cages, though, for what you're doing. Yeah, I'll yeah. show those on the Can next you show slide. Another yeah. option. But I would say that I've actually had a bad experience this fall in some p parts of my field where I had some bull explosion, and they actually went, they were down three or four inches underground and ate the tree off. Yeah. So. Which you can't really protect against if you yeah. go to the park. That's yeah. Trying to have more coyotes, I think. Yep. <laughs> I have been shaking out some uh, coyote urine and blood meal around the trees just as a, another layer of defense. Um, the one thing I'll say about the tree tubes that's really, we won't know for a while, is overall, I'd say on average, I saw 6 to 12 inches of growth on wire cage trees, and I saw 2 to 4 feet on the tree tube trees in the first year, just vertically. But that's really exciting to see, but it's not necessarily a good sign about long-term tree health, just in terms of vertical growth without the stability or if they're kind of flopping in the wind and getting a lot of friction with the tube, there's total, I also am kind of curious, um, the trees that aren't growing as fast, are they actually developing a better root system? They're also, the ones in the welded wire cages like this are moving in the wind more. Um, the tree itself, not just the tube, and so it might actually be developing kind of like more structural integrity. Um, so I think the vertical growth is exciting, but I'm not convinced that it's actually 
a long-term good sign, so that's something I want to wait and see. For the welded wire cages we did here, this is a like two by four inch grid. I bought it in 100 foot rolls um, and then cut it into, um, I did the math with pi and diameter, et cetera. Like some, six or eight or so feet. Or yeah, something. it ends up, I was doing it like roughly two and a half to three foot diameter, so a little more than nine feet, I think, in, per strip. Highly recommend if you're going to do that and buy hundreds of feet of this that you play Home Depot stores off of each other if you're shopping at Home Depot. I was able to get, I was able to get the price down to about 55, 60% of the list price on that item. Um, well, wor well worth a few phone calls, um, especially if you can, you, anyone can sign up for Home Depot's contractor deals. Um, so that's, that was a good move by, on my part. I, I think I saved myself like $3,000 doing that. Um, much lower growth, as I said, long-term effect of that, TBD. The cost is higher, and there's more manual labor to build them, to put them over, to set them in the ground. Um, also, the thing that's great about them, though, is they're reusable. It's very easy to lift it off the tree or to open it up. It's just folded on itself. So if you're going to do multiple establishments on the same site, um, welded wire cages just from like a cost perspective, the, the long-term savings are probably worth the upfront expense. Um, and then here, hard to see here, but um, this is my dad adding hardware cloth bowl protection on here. So we're doing like 18 inch high, uh, 3 inch diameter hardware cloth tubes. And then Summer, our new pup, uh, we, she came out for the second day of bowl protection a week ago and actually got two. So that, that's a big improvement on this yeah. site is having yeah. Summer out there and her learning, you know, where do they hide, what's that smell going after them. A little sad to see how long she takes to kill them, but um, <laughs> she's doing good work. Um, so then in terms of what I just ran through, kind of my takeaway from this year's establishment costs and also other projects I've worked on establishing chestnuts for other folks is the major drivers are uh, trees. So are you starting from your own seed? Are you buying seedlings, which is in the like six to $12 a tree range? Or are you buying cultivars, which can be I mean, 25 might even be low here. I think some cultivars might be 35, 40. Um, so if you're planting, like I did, almost 100 trees per acre when it's all said and done, you know, that's the difference between uh, $50 of seed and three th potentially $3,000 of trees. Um, that's a big driver. Also, number of trees you're planting. So if you are doing cultivars, I wouldn't recommend planting them every 13 feet because then you're thinning out very expensive trees. Uh, my trees only cost me about 50 cents but by the time I've done all the labor to get them to seedling. Um, so thinning out, thinning out a bunch of them doesn't actually cost me that much um, other than the emotional stress of losing trees I raised from seed. Uh, tree protection, um, including labor, is I think ranges basically from $5 to $15 a tree. So depending on your strategy, and if you're doing all the work, if you're paying someone else to do the work, how much you're paying someone else to do the work can add up. Uh, labor costs, I've modeled everything, assuming that every hour work this year was $15 an hour. Um, most of, I think more than half of the labor was mine. And then because so many friends are interested in what I'm doing, I had a lot of volunteers out. I also work with a, a lot of young folks coaching in the area, and so I've had a few guys out just to help them make a few extra bucks, come give me some 18-year-old uh, you know, manual labor, shoveling mulch and stuff. If, if you have it, uh, if you start from seed, how much growth do you expect in the first year? So the bed that was kind of a bust without any mulch, uh, the trees are on average 8 inches. Um, the, the old sheet mulch bed, the trees were on average probably 24 inches. Oh. Or were trees that had such little growth that I'm just not, I didn't even keep them. Um, but yeah, I'd say 24 to 30 inches on the ones that did well. So how close apart are you planting the nuts in this, that mulch? It, it, uh, Very close. Yeah. Like almost on top of each other. Like I basically did two inches apart. Um, and there's a little bit of being gentle as you're pulling them out of the bed and working the roots. You know, you can't just rip them out of the ground. But it didn't seem to create many complications in terms of root development or anything. For sure, not year one, but then you wouldn't yeah. be able to delay getting them out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what that rolls up to, 
Uh, my assessment is you could spend anywhere from 1000 to 4000 per acre in the kind of bootstrap approach to getting uh, this developed. This year for me, it was closer to 3200 an acre, um, but I see where my cost savings can come from. This was also with seedling trees I paid for versus seeds that I've grown. Um, I'm pretty confident just based on a few adjustments that I can get at town to 2000 to 2500 an acre. And that's still counting my own labor as 15 bucks an hour, even though, I, of course, I'm not paying myself at this stage. Um, that said, if you're contracting this out to like a professional uh, design firm who's, you know, upcharging you for all the trees they're buying and all the labor of moving all this stuff, easily, I think this can be a 10,000 per acre project, maybe even more depending on what kind of earthworks you're doing, et cetera. Um, yeah? Why do you plant it so close if you have to thin and later? What's the reason you have uh, So I don't know that every tree is going to be worth keeping. Oh, and what determines that? Uh, a lot of things. So if a vole kills it, then I have a gap, right? If uh, these trees are all – so this is a funny thing about the blight. We talk about it as if it's binary. It's really not. We're talking about a, a continuum of resistance, so like Jono said, even though these are Chinese genetics, that doesn't mean that they're immune to the blight. They're just more resistant. So some of the trees, I've already lost trees to blight. They, you could see the contraction on them. Um, I'll le I took the tree tubes off. I'll leave them. If they want to re-sprout and do better, then so be it. But lose things like that. Um, I watered the plants in. I'm not irrigating, so I'll lose some that are less tolerant of drought stress. Um, there are a few spots of heavier soils on site. If we get a really rainy spring next year, chestnuts don't like wet feet, so I might lose to that. And then and then after all of that's done, so say I lose 20% of my trees to that, then there's questions around uh, nut quality, nut size, um, if they're more vigorous vegetative growers but not actually producing that much. If you know, There's just all sorts of genetic difference. Uh, are they more pollen producers but not nut producers? So a lot of test questions over the next 15, 20 years. Yeah. I, I've probably lost 20% yeah. in two seasons and replanted. Yeah. So I think I, I think I had lost 5% by like October this year, just through the stresses of planting. And I would guess that'll be up to 15 or 20 by the time, uh, you know, I'm seeing what's budding out in the spring. I was wondering if um, you have blight on our wild trees, is that going to make it much harder for me to yeah, so I'm not I, I'm not a pathologist, but my experience and what I've heard from other folks is basically blight is here. There's nothing we can do about blight being here. And so, like, going and cutting down more American chestnut stump sprouts or even, like, you'll see people sometimes online say, like, oh, you had a tree with blight, burn it. It's like, blight's here. There's nothing, you know, that's, I mean, yeah, yeah, maybe you dig it up or, you know, cut it down, but... Blights here, we're really just solving for trees that can survive it. I don't think we can do anything about, like, creating a bubble. Yeah. In the middle over here, you have a question? Yeah, um, I was just wondering what, like, if you're buying a sapling, or conversely, if you're propagating saplings and going to sell them, at what age, how old is the sapling typically when, when people are looking to establish? Yeah, uh, the kind of standing wisdom from more experienced growers, this is what Greg at Empire says is plant it in its permanent home as soon as possible. Um, I do know folks, uh, the Cars Orchard in Hadley, they grew all their trees out to eight feet um, in a nursery before moving them onto into their orchard. That does prevent some of the need for tree protection because they're tall enough that you're not as worried about deer brows. Um, I do think that puts more stress on the tree just because it's a bigger tree, bigger root ball. Um, it's also way harder to move the trees. Um, I don't think there's like a simple answer, but I do, especially watching the difference in the trees that I had for two years in a bed versus that were one-year-old seedlings, um, it does seem like just getting them in the ground after year one in a seedling bed is the right move. And on the market, you'll see them as one- or two-year seedlings. Yeah. Uh, not often, occasionally bigger, but but they're just going to be more stressed and they're just going to have a... Um, when you, when you transplant a tree, it has a, a, a kind of a shock and then a, a period of time where growth slows. So you're getting it over sooner. Where, where are we at on years? Seedlings? I did one and two-year seedlings. 
John, where are we at on time? Uh, we got like, we're, we're closing in. We got eight minutes left. Eight minutes. All right. Um, do people? I think we still have a bunch of questions. Do people want to hear more? The only other thing we are going to talk a little more about is some of the harvesting thinking, um, some of the GIS and mapping work that I've been doing to strategize around land access, and then uh, just kind of a broad conversation on product development. I'm happy to share a little bit about like some of the recipe testing I've done. Um, do you all want to hear about that, or would you yes. rather? Yeah. Okay. Um, any of that in particular? Uh, not the mapping. Not the mapping. Okay. <laughs> Recipe testing, yeah, okay. So, and then in terms of the topics, we're not going to get to, but this is just like a list of some of the stuff we, you know, when Jono calls me up or I call him up, we're chit-chatting about. Um, I have not found any resources in terms of something like Michael Phillips' Holistic Orchard specific to chestnuts. Um, most of the resources i found are including, like, using Roundup and things like that, um, which is not particularly interesting to me. Um, so... Jono, like he was saying, he's been doing some fertigation. Like, I would love to kind of come up with a really good manual for folks around foliar sprays and vole protection and all these little nuances that are going to help create a successful industry. So I plan to do some research this winter around uh, some of the nutrient management issues for chestnuts. Can you mention the companion planting? Yeah, um, so companion planting, in particular, I'm curious about um, some of the insects that are going to have positive effect, particularly thinking about um, some of the pests for chestnuts. So if there are like specific foliar pests that we can identify beneficial insects that are going to go after them. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything that goes after the weevil, for example. I mean, you mentioned plants. What plants would you think to plant? Oh, that's, that's my question. Oh. Yeah. That's the more to come is. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. For this year, I just did chestnuts, and John has been thinking about companion planting from the more the yield sense, and I'm also curious about, um, you know, for example, I have done sites where we plant sea berry or gumi for nitrogen. Um, in some, comfrey? Uh, I've, I've also done comfrey, yeah. Um, it's just the challenge when we get up to even this scale, which is still pretty small scale, is planting a comfrey plant to go with all of what's going to be 2,000 trees next year is just a lot of labor. Um, and so figuring out kind of the right. ways to do that that are worthwhile right. versus focusing more on, like, biological inoculants and yeah, nutrients. Yeah, cover, crop, cover yeah. crop mixes yeah. that you can sow in. Because once you're scaled up to a few acres or more, comfrey would be is great, but, but um, yeah. yeah you, and, and so we're also having to think in sequence, succession sequence, because the shade... The shading is going to change over a period of years, too. So you don't, like, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't put thousands of comfrey roots in as an understory, and then in a few years it's going to start to shade in. I don't know. I think it's, it becomes an issue of labor and scale and management, how clean you're eventually going to want to have the understory cleaner for harvesting. Too. Yeah. So uh, we can talk about this if you want afterwards. We had, we had a specific don't talk about it. Um, uh, this is suitability mapping based on uh, GIS, publicly available GIS layers to be able to ask the question, where can chestnuts be planted on ag land in the Connecticut River Valley of Massachusetts? So we identified 104,000 acres that were suitable um, of ag land in the Connecticut River Valley. And I'm doing some work to expand that into the Hudson Valley and then overlay uh, parcel owner data, so specifically to overlay absentee landowners uh, over that, so I, we can actually then send out a mailing and say, hey, you don't live here, you know, someone's probably just hanging it to get your ag tax incentive, what if we planted trees to get your ag tax incentive? Um, so that's the tease. And the, yeah. Which, which facing? Facing south, facing east? Uh, we actually didn't base it on aspect. Did you have, did you have any in mind? Did it work better? No, there's, there isn't any... We don't have any data to say that aspect is going to matter. I think that would be interesting data to have as the industry grows. But, um, you know, I, I would say be conscious of if they're going to get blasted by the sun in the winter is probably the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, in terms of your, both of your establishment, what, would you, what do you wish you would have done differently or known, you know, getting started? Um, a really good question. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, God, there's a lot 
of things. Um, I have to write the manual. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but I would say things like um, there's some layout differences on my on the on the area. I I think I'd go denser, and I might still go denser in some areas. Um, I think um, more mowing in some areas because I've definitely had some bull outbreaks. Um, and uh, I love having the wildlife and the um, and it's just like that's some amazing life in the field. Uh, but I got to cut that back a little bit and hit the mower more. Yeah, I think ideally for me, I would have started the lease conversation the the summer before and had them seed in a cover the fall before, so that then we could have started planting in April. Um, and then also we just did like I said, just clover and rye. Um, I think I would have loved to do a more diverse cover planting through kind of like the central strip of each alley um, because, you know, we were working we were working with, I don't remember quite what the pass was. I think it was like a 12-foot pass um, that I would have loved the center strip to be like more pollinator friendly and um, more diverse. So harvesting, ground scale harvesting is almost not commercially viable. The folks who are doing it commercially for the most part, have pick your own as their main, so people are paying to pick uh, by hand, um, or they have very cheap labor based on um, kind of local community dynamics that I, I don't even know if I should say out loud. Um, so that's not so commercially viable in the Northeast. Um, there, so the, actually, the only thing I'll add to that is we have played around with things like laying tarps out and then manually harvesting onto the tarps, so doing a little bit of shaking. But chestnuts are um, much more susceptible to the bark fragmenting. They're a very brittle tree, so you can't use like a pecan harvester or some of these other pieces of equipment that actually grab the tree and shake it because you damage the tree too much. Um, but the, in China and Japan, for example, they use long wooden poles and slap the branches and then collect. So it's a way of kind of accelerating the drop. Um, you don't want to force the nuts out of the tree because if you harvest them early, you get lower nut quality. Mechanical harvesting. Um, Michigan State did a case study proving that a machine like this, FACMO, which is an Italian-made machine, is uh, makes sense at over eight acres um, in terms of just the economics of it. The only issue I have with this is it doesn't really, it's not that compatible with silvopasture or some of these other agroforestry practices. Um, you'd be sweeping up animal products uh, with your nuts, uh, both illegal and gross. Um, <laughs> but there are ways, you know, you could do an early pass uh, early enough in the season probably. It's, it's just going to, uh, with the animals I mean, um, but... It's just going to reduce the productivity of that land if you're dependent on ground harvesting. Um, one thing I'm really interested in, I spent a little bit of time in the Ardèche region of France, which produced about 40% of their chestnuts, and they run olive netting down slope here, these green nets, and then they picket it at the bottom, so it actually creates like a catchment channel, and then they actually have a backpack-mounted vacuum tube that's like 10 inches in diameter that they harvest through that tube sorts it and, and launches the nuts into a truck following behind them. Um, I think something like that is really promising. Um, yes, it's a lot more upfront investment, but it allows for more diverse management of that landscape um, rather than just harvesting for kind of a bare floor to harvest, or managing for a bare floor to harvest from. Uh, but again, it's a little bit dependent on a slope or picketing the net at the center of the tree and running it down into the alley, something like that. Uh, product development, uh, I am actually currently um, kind of investigating the opportunity to launch a food company um, based on chestnut products. Um, so I've been looking at things like an oatmeal alternative. Um, this right here is what's called a Dutch baby. It's a Dutch oven baked um, pancake basically. So looking at mixes like a pizza dough mix or a Dutch baby or a pancake mix. Um, I do crepes all the time. I recently did a what I called it eight tree bread, which had eight different trees in it, including chestnut flour. It's kind of like a ban banana bread with olive oil, cacao, carob, mesquite. Wait, you count the bananas as a tree? Yeah. I did. <laughs> Cheating. All right, all right, seven trees. But seven's a better number anyway. Um, so yeah, and then in terms of product development, I mean, this is a starch crop. So in terms, as John said, there is. 
um, kind of unquenchable demand for fresh nuts. And um, at some point, we're going to get to a point where all of the chestnut producers are competing just over the fresh nut market. And if we really want these trees to be over millions of acres, um, which I would love to see in my lifetime, uh, replacing corn and wheat and soy with a tree-grown starch crop, then we're actually going to have to use it as a gluten-free flour source and really as a starch replacement for some of these annual crops. Um, and so that's going to require, in my mind, product development around people really starting to understand uh, how to use this tree-grown starch crop in their cooking. So whether that's selling flour or selling things like pre-made pizza doughs, uh, to me that's a necessary investment that we have to be making if we want this industry to reach that scale. So you're looking for investors? <laughs> always. <laughs> I never ask, but I'm always interested. Yeah, yeah. on the ground floor. Um, have you found that running sheep or chicken uh, in between the, the alleys reduce fold pressure and deer pressure? Wait, I missed the beginning. Say, uh, running animals oh. in the system, does it reduce wild animals in the system? I think that has yet to be determined. Yeah, you, TBD, I would yeah. guess yes. I guess the more human activity yeah. and human-related activity, yes, but I don't know when, that anyone's proven wild that. Animals want to eat Chickens? <laughs> well, those are the wild animals that aren't going to bother the trees, so those, those <laughs> ones are okay. <laughs> yeah, you put the chickens and the coyotes come Yeah, in yeah, maybe that's, that's a great coyote yeah, bait. Yeah, yeah that's it. That's 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 a good idea. I'm just realizing that the, the, yeah. ah. you said that the, the cost of uh, tree tubes is 5 to 15 bucks per tree, whereas the ceiling itself is 50 cents. So if you found a way to plant bunch more trees and not have to protect them, uh, you could pick out the individual trees that do best, have a much higher density, um, and, you know, have the obligation of having animals there, which is always a plus for the system. I think there's a lot of different variations on these themes, yeah. and it's going to be site-dependent, budget-dependent, and, and, and some of these other factors. So, the property that I'm on, because it's so surrounded by this intensive ag land, the deer population is super low. I've been pulling some of the cages off trees and and moving them to other trees, and I don't I have virtually I have no deer pressure. Um, but I didn't really know that, and I was a little nervous to start going to year one, you know, assuming that. So, um, but if you could find a way to reduce your need to do this and, and take a certain percent of loss or a higher thinning loss is sort of a game of how much loss can you handle um, and what, you know, there's sort of like if you imagine two sides, you're going to have more investment in each tree, more protection, more investment, or go out on the other end of very little. And I've done restoration projects where we planted thousands of trees at super high density to do forest restoration, super low investment per tree. And you can have a lot of success that way. Um, so I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to yeah. do that. And yeah, I think there's it's just so much experimentation that can happen. There's a lot of variables we're playing with. I have wondered about just direct seeding. Um, you know, just digging a little. I mean, if I'm going to have a few thousand seeds, that really doesn't cost me that much money to do a whole row just with seed, uh, from seed this year. Uh, the other thing is I hadn't even thought about this before the voles hit but they all hit coming from the one edge of the field that's on a hay field, right? So none of, none of the voles that are going after my trees are coming from the forest, they're coming from the soy. So, for example, next year I could do more of a barrier along the edge with the hay field, which sounds like a lot, but really it's just like buying a few hundred feet of hardware cloth and, and staking it out. Um, that might actually, I hadn't even thought of that until you just asked that question, but that might be a more appropriate way to keep the voles out. Could be a trap. So yeah. our time is actually up, and you all can have a little break. But we'll do one question. We have we have our um, emails uh, here. If you want to be in touch, or we can come and ask questions afterwards. But we'll end with a last question. You also have a couple upcoming events. I mentioned the April fifth one already. I plugged that in, <laughs> in in the middle here, and I forgot. Is there a cost for that workshop? Yes. What's the cost? <laughs> Sixty-five for members. 
I'm going to buy us a burger for a whole day, and then we'll tour the um, farm, too. It's going to be a blast. Yeah, and to add to the event list, I know I mentioned the chestnut brunch earlier. We will be doing a second annual version of that, and we're trying to open up uh, that to basically everyone. So if you want to be on the mailing list for the chestnut brunch or just farm updates, you know, tidbits like what we're sharing today, you can just send me an email and I'll add you. And, and there's another, I have an event that's going to get on the calendar too. It's part of the grant, so I'll have a field day. Um, did I already mention this? Where Kara's going to come out and do... Um, about the proxy testing and soil testing, and we're also going to talk about the trees. So, um, so yeah, lots of lots of good events that we'll be putting out through, uh, probably through some of the NOFA channels and otherwise. Do, do we have time? Want to, well, let's end and just come up with, with questions and let you all have a break before the next session. Thank you all for your time. Thanks for coming.